Church, welcome to JFC Online Service. Yeah. We all are children of God. Let's sing with all of your heart. Come on.
to be praised. Praise. 
we swear it, Father. Yes, God. We thank you, Lord, for our lives. We thank you for the gift of life, Lord Jesus. We look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, oh God. You are our hope. You are our peace and our strength, oh God. No one else but you, Lord Jesus. You deserve the glory, oh God. Take all the glory.
Start the day with a joke. What type of spray is like a chocolate? 
we've been missing you over the past month, I think it is. We've lost count, but I hope that you're doing okay. Um, let's see what we've been doing over the past month. Yay! We got So I'm slimy. Oh, I didn't get to the wind yet. I'm going to Guys, we, we all miss you and can't wait together uh, to meet you all together again. Uh, just really want to encourage everyone. We know this could be some really anxious times and, and different uh, circumstances that can worry us or keep us awake at night. But I just want to remind you of God's promise in, in Psalm 34 verse 10. It says, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Guys, we love you, miss you, and can't wait to see you again. See you guys. Has the point to see you soon. Bye. 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 Good morning, everyone. We just wanted to say hey from our family. Um, we hope everyone's doing well and safe and staying healthy during this time. We all miss you all and um, we hope to see you soon. Yeah, even though we can't be together physically, just know that we are together um, unity in spirit um, and your prayers and thoughts for all together. Um, uh, just letting you know that you shout out is online. So make sure every Friday you're on Instagram Live. We have youth leaders that do Q&As, to panels, to preachings. So make sure you're there. Um, we miss you guys so, so much. And I know that this will all pass over soon. We pray in Jesus' name. We'll be all over soon. And we'll get to be together again. Love you guys. Good morning, church. How are you doing? I hope you are all doing well. It's good to be here again to share with you on offering. And this morning, I'm going to read to you from the book of uh, Luke, chapter 16, verse 13. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despite the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So first of all, we have to understand that we don't own anything on earth. So when we came to this world, we came with empty hand. And when we leave this world, we will also leave uh, with uh, uh, empty hand as well. And for example, I have my two kids. And uh, one day, Jessie will grow up and Bethany will also grow up and she will marry someone and, you know, I don't own my children anymore. So God just gave us everything so that he can, you know, how he can, uh, he entrusts us to use all of the finance and everything that he gave to us so that we can use it for his kingdom. And for my job as a father, my job is to look after my kids and raise them up to be in the way of God so that they one day when they grow up, they will follow a God and believe in God as well. So this morning, as we come to the time of giving, I would like to share with you that. So there will be the time that God will ask us to give and especially the things that we hold so tight and we don't want to give it away. For example, in Genesis chapter 22, so when God appeared to Abraham and said that, Abraham, I want you to go to the mountain and offer Isaac, your son, your only son, as the offering uh, sacrifice. So as a father, and he only has uh, one son, it will be very, very difficult for him to offer his only son to God. But Isaac, uh, but Abraham obeyed the Lord and he did it. So he took Isaac up to the mountain. And in the end, you heard the story many times, I believe that God showed up and rescued Isaac. So this morning, as we come to give, 
back to our Heavenly Father. I would like you to give it from uh, your heart, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, say this, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So it will be a great opportunity for each one of us to give each time. So God, He owns everything, and He doesn't want you know, anything that we own on earth here. But one thing that He is looking into, it is our heart and our attitude, because God owns everything. So this morning as we come to give, let us just pray and bow our head together. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You are our provider. Lord, we, we are here because of you. And we have whatever, Lord, in our life because your generosity, because your love, Father God. Lord, this morning, as my brother and sister, Lord, give toward, Lord, the work, that this church is already established and do a lot of mission work and blessing, a lot of uh, blessing, Father God, Lord, to this community. And I just pray that you will bless those who give and also those who have, Lord, the desire to give as well, Father God, Lord. I just want to commit, Father, Lord, this morning into your mighty name, into uh, your mighty name, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. It's my time to do the communion. Uh, so the communion is such a, a, a statement saying that to love God more is to know Him more. And how to do it? To love God more and to know Him more. We know Him by reading the Word. To know Him by fellowship with each other. Know Him also to um, connect with Him. But the communion is one part of our Christian work with God and make us to love God more and to develop our relationship with Him. And I want to share with you in the book of John, I read from an NIV. The book of John from chapter 6, from verse uh, uh, 35 to verse, 30, to verse 58, where I don't read it all, I just want to talk about this. It's here in Jesus say, I am the bread of life. He comes for, to me, never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And on Jesus talking about in, in verse um, 53, he's talking about, uh, here Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And whoever eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And here he's make a statement that when we come together, when we uh, take the communion, and this is the bread of life, this is the, the, the blood of Jesus. It's, what we do over here is symbol of Jesus. And this morning, I w- just want to encourage all of you at home, taking the bread, and taking the cup, and remember, if Jesus say, I am the bread of life, and I mean, we coming to Him and to love Him more is to know Him more. To know Him is about to have communion with Him each day of our life. In our life here, you know, we like, for example, like our family, a wife, and children. To know each other more and to love them more is also to know and to de- develop more. So this morning, as you have the bread and the cup with you, I just want to pray for all of you. Thank you, Jesus, you have come down from heaven, from the Father, so that we have faith in the Father. Lord, be with us, encourage us to love you more, encourage us to know you more. And Lord Jesus, as you say, when we partake your life and your blood, that we have eternal life within us. Lord Jesus, I would just want you to bless all of your people in your church today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let me partake. And thank you, Jesus. This is your blood, the symbol of your life. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have made a new covenant to all of us here. Let us come to say, to love you more is to know you more. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, Pastor David, come. Well, good morning, church. I trust that uh, you've read the first four chapters of Corinthians, which I uh, recommended to you last week. Uh, in case uh, you didn't, you switched off too early, um, then please listen and maybe read it after uh, this message so you can uh, appreciate it more fully. So before we start, I'm just going to open up in prayer. Father, I thank you that we can come to your word today. The Lord, we could come and uh, look into it and see how it applies to our life so that we might make it something of value in everything we do. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, I'm going to start a series on the book of 1 Corinthians. So the first section that I'm going to do is from chapters 1 to chapters 4. Obviously, because of time, I'm not going to go to every detail in these four chapters, but I want to take the themes that are there so that we can understand and see the linkage uh, in Paul's argument as he speaks to the church in Corinth. So when we look at this, I first want to introduce some thoughts so that it will help us in understanding what we are doing. The Bible, like Jesus, is 100% divine and 100% human. Divine that it is the inspired Word of God. It's human in that it's written to a particular group of people having a particular language uh, and living in a particular time period. Uh, the first, which is the divine nature of the Word, never changes. The second, which is the human nature of the Word, changes over time. What changes, by that I mean what changes is that the, um, the meanings of the words change, the values change, languages change, cultural references change, and examples change. So we need to understand what the Bible means in the context of the time it was written so that we can then apply it to our lives now in the 21st century. If we ignore that and just do what you call cut and paste, we will, become, we will get something entirely different from the Word of God than what Paul wrote and meant it to be. The next thing we need to think about is the history of the church in Corinth because it is written to a particular church in a particular place. So we need to know the church in Corinth. The, the thing about the church in Corinth, it was very different than most of the other churches that Paul planted because it was not planted with a strong um, synagogue informed group of people. It was actually far more uh, Greek and Roman in culture than it was uh, Jewish or um, yeah, yeah, Jewish culture. How do we know that? I want to give you a few scriptures as we look at it. In one, Acts 18 verses uh, 5 to 6, it says this, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him in protest, he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So very early on in Paul's time in preaching in the synagogue in the city of Corinth, he was rejected and so left. Some followed him, but not a large number. And then you come down into verse 9 of the same chapter and it says, One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. But speak and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will lay a hand on you or harm you, for there are many in the city who are my people. So we see very clearly that 
There is a, a, a quite a number of people who become Christians in Corinth, not from the synagogue, but from the community, because Paul left, leaves the synagogue, and for over a year, he stays in Corinth ministering to the people there. So we have a church that is built not on synagogue and form values, but unfortunately, it starts to build on Greco-Roman values. And so the problem that we have in the church, and it's addressed through the whole letter of Paul to the, in the first uh, epistle to the Corinthians, is that it's uh, focusing on cultural values in the church. Because what has happened is that people have come and brought their cultural values into the church, not allowing the biblical values to modify and change their cultural values. So the cultural values have imposed themselves in the church, and so the community is building on Greco-Roman values. And this is the thing that Paul underlyingly is uh, speaking to. What is 1 Corinthians? It is an occasional letter. What that means is in a letter that is addressing issues and is being addressed to see changes in those who are reading this letter. In other words, the Church of Corinth. He starts it off with a typical way of starting. He defines who he is, an apostle of Christ. Now that's very important because an apostle is one who comes in the authority of another. If someone comes as an apostle of Caesar, he comes with the authority of Caesar. To disobey him is means you will be put to death because he represents Caesar. Caesar. So for Paul to say he comes uh, in the authority of someone greater than Caesar, that his patron is greater than Caesar, then uh, you need to watch out because he has greater authority than Caesar in what he is proclaiming. So Paul sets his authority to what he is going to say to them. That's the first thing. So he's saying to them, you need to listen. I come with authority from my patron, which everyone knows is Jesus Christ himself. Paul then identifies who he is talking to, which is the church in Corinth. And then he goes on and he commends them for good things that are happening in that church. And he does all this before he starts to come to deal with issues that need to be dealt with. The first one that he comes to deal with is the issue of division. Now, Paul has to do this because the division is, as we will find out later, is division according to who you like as a leader. And so some like Paul, some like Apollos, some like Cephas, and some like Jesus Christ. But he comes and says he needs to address this first because only those who like him will listen to him. And so if he does not change the way they think, then they are not going to read the rest of the letter. So this is the first issue that he must deal with, which he does. Um, it's interesting to note that Paul is dealing with division not as we see division. This is division of community not division because of doctrine. It is a group of people who are starting to divide in their community because of who they like and who they don't like. This is different to the division of today because today's division is mainly about uh, I believe this and someone else believes something else and so we divide according to what we believe. And so to get unity today, what we see is that we try to get everyone on the same page as what we believe and also on the same page as how we govern our churches. And so today, they are the things of importance. We would love to remove all denominations and have just one church. And we would say we are unified. Actually, that is not the division or the unity that Paul is dealing with or talking about when he comes to the church in Corinth. It is the division of a community that 
is divided because of their preference for a particular person or not that person. To understand what is going on and what Paul is actually saying, we need to look at two issues in Corinth uh, so that we can interpret the scriptures according to the what Paul is talking to in the first century. The first one is the honor shame client patron relationship of the first century. This is found throughout the Roman Empire and even further than that, but it is very important and it is one of the principles that is going on in the Church of Corinth. The first century society is built on an on a client patron structure. 90% of the wealth is owned by 8% of the population. Those who have who do not have money attach themselves to those who are wealthy. The wealthy become the patrons and the poor who attach themselves to the wealthy become the clients. The client lives his life then to honour his patron, both in speech and action. He does not do something to uh, make his patron look bad. He does not say things which will dishonour his patron, but only what will honour him. That's how he lives. The patron then resources the client so he has money to live or to do to business or those sort of things. Uh, and as well as that, he is given imputed honour from the patron. In other words, the honour of the patron reflects on the honour of the client. So the honour of the client, as I said, the honour of the client is dependent on the patron. Now, Corinth is a community that is vying for honour. It is a wealthy city. In fact, the reason for its wealth is that the wheat that is grown in Egypt is moved to Rome. And in fact, Rome controls the whole empire by having control of wheat. Uh, it, it then can withhold wheat from rebellious people and starve them to submission. So, but the wheat to get to Rome must go through Corinth and it comes in one side of Corinth. It is then unloaded, taken across the isthmus and then reloaded into boats and taken on to Corinth. In doing that, there is labour that is uh, required to unload, to move the uh, wheat and to reload it. And that creates wealth, which then becomes the wealth of Corinth. And so we have a lot of money coming into Corinth. It is a rich area. And because of that, people become wealthy and then they are looking to increase their honour because wealth is not enough. Honour is the thing that you are looking for. So uh, there is this vine for honour in Corinth that is not found in any other city except Rome itself. Uh, and so honour has a very, very high part to play in the lifestyle and the thinking of the people in Corinth. So because it is up upwardly mobile, strong in wealth acquisition, they are looking to gain honour. And that's the goal of every upper class person. That's the first thing we must remember, this thing that's going on in Corinth of honour and acquiring a better status for oneself. The next thing we need to know about Corinth is something that's called the Ismian Games. The Ismian Games was one of a number of ancient Greek games. The one we know the best is the Olympic Games, which uh, started back, way back in the, before uh, the first century, but is still today uh, celebrated throughout the world. Not this year because of coronavirus, but constantly it is celebrated. Um, the Olympic Games is a games which is about athletics. And the original one was about athletics. Um, and, but in the modern game, what's happened is the one event which is the, like the um, top event is the marathon. To win the marathon is to be the 
top person in the games. You are the crowning pinnacle of the games because you have won the marathon. That's the Olympic Games. The Izmian Games also had athletics, but they were more noted for was the oratory uh, competition that went on in these games. Oratory means speaking. And so as well as athletics, there was speaking competitions. And there were basically three types of speaking. The first one was the forensic. Forensic is the legal way of speaking. So in a law court, when you are talking, um, you know, the, arguing law points, that's called forensic speaking. And so that was one form of speaking. The next one was epidactic. And that was a speech to honor someone or to blame someone. And that was very common. Today, we have in a funeral, a eulogy. Eulogy means good words. So it's a speech that is to show honor to someone who has passed away. So we have that sort of speaking, epidactic. And then the next one was called deliberative. Now, that was an argument or debate often used in Parliament. Uh, today, it's used in Parliament, a debating form of speaking. That was common in the Roman Republic. But when the Caesars rose to power, it became very dangerous to use uh, deliberative speaking in public, especially if you said something that Caesar is not happy about. It may end your life very quickly. So in the public arena, the deliberative style of speaking stopped not in the private sector, but in the public, and a new form developed out of it, which was called the ornamental competition. And the ornamental competition was simply this. They would judge people on how they looked. So a person who was overweight, didn't look strong and handsome, uh, would lose points. You were you are judged on your looks, your smell, you had to smell nice, you had to look good, and you had to speak good. Your ability to, of, of oratory was something of high importance in this game. One of the way they would judge a person is how long people held, uh, their, how long they could hold people's attention in their speaking. But the one thing about this competition, the content of what the person said had no bearing on the, the result of the competition. It was all about how you did it, not what you presented. Now, this is the important thing to note as we come to look at these four chapters. The person who won the oratory skill, uh, was he, he, he was called... Uh, the wise one of the age. Now that's important to remember because that means so much to a person in Corinth when he hears that term, he knows exactly what you're talking about. So now we've laid the foundation. Let's now come and look at the problem. In 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 12. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no division amongst you, but that you be united in the same mind, in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels amongst you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you say, says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to uh, Cephas, which is Peter, or I belong to Christ. So what's happening? The first thing that we see that is happening is that there are forming of client-patron relationships. Now the difference about these relationships is firstly they were client patron relationships solely within the church community and not sanctioned by the patrons. There is no transference of money from any patron to any client. Paul is not paying those who are following him. Apollos is not paying those who are following him. And obviously, Jesus is not paying any 
to follow him. So there is no resources going from the patron to the client. The patrons, um, so, sorry, let me get this. The only value of these client-patron relationships is the input of honour that can be generated by the clients. That is the most important thing to understand, that these divisions are happening because through them, people in the church can be seen to have a higher honour. Honour is attributed to the clients according to the perceived honour of the patron. So if a patron is seen to be of greater honour than another, then those who follow him have greater honour. However, a patron's honour is established by how many clients he has. So the one with the most clients will also be the one that generates the most honour. Now, if in the church there is only one patron, then all clients have equal honour. So it is not to the advantage of those in the church that want to get greater honour to have a system where there is only one patron. So this is the reason why these divisions are happening in the church. It is building a competitive structure. I remember several years ago, uh, we had a relationship with the church and uh, we would sometimes meet together and it was interesting when we came together because there was a lot of um, sense, uh, people, not from this church, but from the other church saying, we have the greatest youth group in the, he, that there is, you know, our church is fantastic, it's the best. And then second, thirdly, it was saying, you know, our pastor is just amazing, we got the best pastor. And I always felt uncomfortable about it because there was only our church and their church. And the only thing they were really saying is, we are better than you. Because there was no one else here to compare with. And I look at that and I think, that's the sort of competitiveness that was the, is what Corinth was like. There was this competitiveness going on. And if we get into that sort of thing, we are going to be in the same position as the church in Corinth. So let's go on and now start to see how Paul then addresses this problem. Okay, so the first thing Paul does is he starts to talk about wisdom. And it's really interesting because in the first three chapters of the book of Corinthians, he talks about wisdom 16 times, it's mentioned. And then only once more in the whole book of Corinthians, which is in chapter 12. So in these three chapters, he is emphasizing one thing. He's using emphasis to illustrate his point. And the emphasis is to look at wisdom. Let's have a look at it. 1 Corinthians 1, 20 to 21. What is, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. Now, remember, this is not written to us. It's written to the church at Corinth. And as soon as you use those words, uh, the one who is wise, the debater of the age, everyone in Corinth knows exactly what you're talking about. You are talking about the person who is the ornamental orator, the one who uses articulated speech. He is the wise one. And so Paul is now bringing up to make them understand this wise one uh, where are they in the sense of in the church? God does not use that form of wisdom. That's what he's saying. So he starts to bring an argument out uh, looking at this sort of person and then we'll see what he does with it. Firstly, the other one that's there that uh, I didn't bring out is the scribe. 
these people who were the, or, the orators were also ones who could read and write, and therefore they were known as scribes. So we have uh, very clearly an understanding of what Paul is talking about. Paul is using exaggeration here, which is a common way of getting a point across in Greek lit- literature because he says the wisdom of this world, but what we have is foolishness. So he's going to extremes to uh, exaggerate a point saying it is not according to the wisdom of this world that we came to you. It is not according to the wisdom of this age that you were saved but it's according to the wisdom of God. And so he calls it foolishness to bring the the exaggeration in to bring the point. He then concludes by saying that the, the foolishness of God is greater than what the ornamental orator has to offer. Let's have a look at it. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks or the Gentiles. But to those who are called by both Jew and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So our faith is not established on the wisdom of this world. And that means the way the oriental, sorry, ornamental orator Uh, speaks, but it's based on the wisdom of God. The second thing he says is found in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26. Consider your own self. Call, brothers and sisters, not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. What he's saying is that none of you in the church fit the profile of an ornamental orator. Because the three things you have to have to be an ornamental orator is that you must have worldly wisdom. In other words, that means the ability to hold people through your speech. Secondly, you've got to be wealthy. You can't be poor to be involved in such things, so you must have wealth. And thirdly, you must have high status. You must be a person of high status, someone who is noble birth, high status person, to be involved in those sort of things. So Paul is saying, none of you here can ever measure up to this person who is the ornamental orator. So don't use him as you're measuring, because God is not choosing you according to that measurement. No one can assume a position of importance and have higher status because of their gifts. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 31. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world Uh, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are. So So that no one may boast in the presence of God. He is the source of our life. In Christ Jesus, we become, who becomes for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, in the context of what Paul is saying, in his reference to the ornamental orator, he's saying your own giftings, your own look, your own abilities have nothing to do with how God works. In fact, it also he is saying here that there is only one person who can be your patron, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Then Paul goes on in chapter 2 and he illustrates himself against the ornamental orator. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the wisdom of God to you in lofty words of wisdom. The oriental, so the ornamental orator's 
way of doing things. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and, in, and Him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation was not with plausible words of wisdom, again, equating to the ornamental orator, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith may rest not in human wisdom, the ornamental orator, but in the power of God. So we see here Paul is equating how he does things in comparison with the ornamental orator and saying my way and his way are not the same. God's way and the ornamental orator's way is not the same. It has no place in the house of God. Paul also is saying content is more important than charisma. You see, having the spirit far outweighs the charisma of the ornamental orator. And so Paul is making this point very clear. It is not about presentation. It is about content. Okay. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 12 to 13. Now you have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit that is from God, so that you may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Again, what he's saying here, the way of the ornamental orator will never understand the things of God because that is natural wisdom and what God provides is wisdom from the Spirit. And the ornamental orator pathway you, will give you nothing of what God has got for you. So we cannot follow the ornamental orator as our means of doing things. It's really interesting when you look at the modern church. Twice now I have listened to messages, not in this church here, but when I have been at conferences, uh, some overseas, uh, I think both of them overseas. Um, and someone gets up and he presents a message and it starts off like this. It starts off and says, you know, the Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. He's taking a scripture that God spoke, speaks to Samuel when he is going to find the new king to anoint to be king over Israel, which was David. And God says, don't look at the outward appearance. Man does that, you look at the heart. And, they, and, and what God is saying to Samuel is, don't look at the outward appearance. Listen to me and I will show you the one because I'm the one that can see their hearts. And that scripture is taken and done the other way around. He says, if you want to reach the world, he said, man looks at the outward appearance. So you've got to make the outward appearance look fantastic so that it will attract man into the church so he can be touched by God. It sounds plausible. Then they go on and they make this statement and they say, you know, it was the house of Solomon that attracted the Queen of Sheba. And she came and she saw the excellence of the house. She saw everything so well polished, well done, and everything was fantastic. And because of that, she was one. Well, I question that a little bit because we don't find any ongoing uh, relationship with the Queen of Sheba or the nation of Sheba with the nation of Israel. But she is attracted and that's their claim. And so presentation and excellence becomes the very thing that we start to look for. And it is something that is found in the modern church. One of the principles is if you are not that good at oratory person, you will never have the opportunity to speak in a church that follows those values. If you are overweight, something like this, then you will not 
get an opportunity to speak or to sing or to do something publicly in a church that follows those values. If you are too old, again, you will never be able to speak or minister in such a church. Everything is done to attract. It really interests me because what we are taking is the Old Testament to develop our understanding. Now, the Bible is very clear. The Old Testament is illustrative. It is not for forming doctrine. So it's the New Testament. And the issue to me is that when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to chapter 4, it is very clear that Paul is saying we are not to go the way of performance, but we are to go the way of substance. And so to me, we need to be careful how we judge and how we do things that it is done by the wisdom of God, not by the wisdom of God, man. So the question now that we have to ask is why is Paul talking about wisdom when he is wanting to deal with the issue of division? See, the only reason he's talking like that is because they are using the ornamental orator as a standard for measuring their leaders by. And if they do that, then the one who's going to come out on top is Apollos, because he is an outstanding speaker. He is eloquent, far above all the others. If you look in Acts chapter 18, verse 24, now there was a, there, sorry, there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in scripture. He was eloquent, but also well versed in scripture. And so we see uh, that this has become partly what the church is using as their standard for measuring a leader. And Paul is saying, you've got it wrong. And he is doing what he should do, and that's first addressing the reason why they are elevating a person and their ministry. So he establishes the fact that all are equal and there is no division. And he is not attacking Apollos because actually Paul and Apollos are in the same church when he writes this letter and they are in agreement with what he writes. So it's, it's not that he is out against Apollos because he is a better speaker. No, he, Paul is saying regardless of how good a speaker, it is content, not eloquence that you need to measure a person by. So that's his first thing that he does. So that's, after he establishes that, he comes and the next thing he says basically is all are needed in building. The key, the key scripture to this is in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 to 7. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither... The one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. Okay, he now moves from talking about four to talking about two, which is Paul and Apollos, uh, because they too had the biggest impact and also they are the best to illustrate what Paul wants to illustrate. Firstly, he's saying all of these are needed for the job. You can't select one and ignore the others. You need all three. Firstly, if any one of these three are removed, then nothing will grow. Let's have a look at it. Apollos needs Paul to plant the seed. Otherwise, if he waters, all he's going to get is weeds. Paul, who plants the seeds, needs Apollos to water so that the seeds would grow. And they all need God to cause increase. Amen? So that's the issue. Now you take any one of those out, then it will not work. If Paul does not plant, Apollos has nothing to water. If 
God does not cause the increase, nothing will grow. But if Paul and Apollos don't do their job, then God cannot increase anything because there is nothing to increase. So Paul is wanting us to understand or wanting the Corinthians to understand you cannot separate any one of these. They are all needed and must all be equally valued for their input. So that what is sown in the church might come to full result. So that's the content of the next part he's saying. So instead of dividing leadership, you need to bring them together. You know, and even in our church, there is a preference for certain preachers. So I like this preacher better than another one. Uh, That's fine. There's not a problem in that, just so long as we don't bring it to competition. But you need to recognize that each one has a different thing and they bring what they have. And together we build something in the house of God. One alone cannot do it. It requires more than one person to input into the church. Okay, so after Paul establishes that, he then comes to the final bit that he needs to address in 1 Corinthians 3, 21 to 23. It says, So let no one boast about human leaders, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, Peter, or the world, the, wo- the world, or life, or death, or the presence, or the present, or the future, all belong to you. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Now, what is he saying? Client patron relationships. No patron belongs to the client. So, in what Paul is saying, he's saying, neither Paul, Apollos, or Peter are your patrons because we belong to you. You belong to Christ. So therefore, your patron is Christ. You have only one patron. And because you have only one patron, then you are equal in honour. So Paul establishes that. Good point. But then he goes on and he he says something else which is so, so important. And we find that in the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 2. Think of us in this way, as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mystery. Moreover, it is required, uh, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Sounds nice, doesn't it? We are servants and we are stewards. The one problem when you translate from one language to another and you also are translating something written in the first century to the 21st century, that meanings of words change. And the the translators do their best to get the word of closest fit. And so for the word for Slave, because we don't have slavery in Australia or the, in the developed world at least, uh, slave does not have the best meaning for us. So the best they could find was servant. And then the word steward for one who is responsible is the word of best fit. But in doing that, they miss the real meaning of what Paul is saying. Because... And it's the only time he uses this word in ever in his writing. So it's really important to remember that because uh, he's using it to get a point across. He says we are not servants, but we are slaves and not just slaves. Herparates is the word that he uses. It's a particular type of slave. And the word means under rowers. And it refers to those who rowed in the galleys, uh, in the ships to take goods across the Mediterranean. There were three levels. And the bottom level were called the Hipparates. They were the bottom of the row. And the only place you went from there was to your death. There was no promotion from position of Hipparates. It was the lowest place and a place of no honour. And so Paul says we are 
slaves. We are not just slaves. We are herperates. We are under rowers. That's the first thing he says. Get our position correct. We are not patrons. We are under rowers. And then he goes on and he says, we are stewards. Now the word is um, uh, oikonomos, which means we are responsible for the running. And in this case, of the under rowers. And he said, we're not only under rowers, but we are responsible for all the other under rowers under our authority. Now, if you're a first century person in Corinth and you listen to that, you know exactly what he's saying. Because they know Paul to be their leader, their steward. And so if they are, if he is their steward and he is a herperati, that means they also are Hipparates, which are under rowers. They are slaves of the lowest status. That's what Paul is saying they are. Amazing. They were looking for a patron who could cause their honour to grow to grow higher. And Paul is saying, you are the lowest of slaves who have no honour, but you are there doing a job until you die. And so Paul says all our responsibility is to, to make sure you can do your job. We are under rowers also, but we have an added responsibility to make sure your job can be fulfilled. So Paul is saying in this area of status, of client-patron relationship, of trying to attain a greater position is saying, understand this, you are the lowest slaves. You don't have the right or the opportunity to choose your patron. No slave has the right to choose a patron. He is, belongs to a patron because the patron paid a price for him. Jesus paid the price for us. We are his slaves. We are, he is our patron because we are his slaves. No choice. They cannot choose Apollos. They cannot choose Peter. They cannot choose uh, Paul as their as their patron because they belong to Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. There is no honour found in this relationship because they are the lowest of the low. So they cannot use that to increase their place in their community. All they can do is be about the master's business without any expectation of reward. Paul unpacks these chapters to let the Corinthians know that division is not an option in the church. We are all belonging to one patron, which is Jesus Christ. We all have the same honour, which is very little if we are Hipparates. Disunity is built on a value of superiority and not seeing what each, uh, each person has to offer and realizing that we need their input. If we are to build what God wants, we have to do that. You know, one of the things that saddens me the most when I look at a monocultured church is that we are saying, we don't need you with us. We can do it by ourselves. You know, I wonder what Paul would say to the 21st century church if he was here today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are speaking so clearly to the church of Corinth in the first century. Yet also, as we understand what you're saying to them in their time, you speak also very clearly to us and how we are to live our lives, how we are to build our church and relationships so that we may honour Jesus, who is our patron, who has paid the price for us, and we who are merely his slaves can follow him because we are his. Father, bless each person, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Turn 
Well, thank you for being with us today. Trust you've had a great time in the, your fellowships at home. Um, and as the COVID virus uh, restrictions start to come down, it would be great to invite other ones to your home and to enjoy it and have fellowship in your homes with others. So let's uh, pray as we come to the end of this uh, service. Father, we just thank you for your presence upon each person who is part of this family and each one who has listened to this uh, service today, Father. I pray for each one as they leave their particular locations that your blessing would be upon them. Lord, as they go about their business, Father, we thank Thank you for your presence. We, I pray for health upon each one, Father, and protection. And Lord, that uh, you would be with us and that we may come back to rejoice together again in the future. Bless each one, I pray in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.